are continuing on our podcast series presenting live lectures that were done at CCTMC 2016 this year. And on the line, I have Dr. Chris Fuligar. Welcome to the show, Chris. Hi, thank you very much. Glad to be back. We have an exciting lineup here with all of these talks from CCTMC. If you haven't had a chance to actually go to a CCTMC conference in person, I highly recommend it. There's a number of very intelligent people who share some great ideas, and you also have a chance to meet a whole lot of great people as well. The feedback that we've been getting regarding the podcast that we've uploaded both during EMS week and over the past several days has been incredibly positive, and today is no exception. We are going to be digging into operationalizing Reboa, and Reboa is a device which we've heard quite a bit about in the emergency department space, especially with the transition from the 9 French to the 7 French catheter. And Dr. Justin McLean talks about how to operationalize the deployment of this device and the associated protocols within one's service. Dr. McLean is currently a PGY-4 at Denver Health in Denver, Colorado. He is also a graduate of my alma mater, the Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. And this is uh, an ongoing part of uh, the CCTMC Electricious series, which I'm sure you're going to enjoy quite a bit. So stand by, and we hopefully you will enjoy the lecture on Roboa, the resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta, and the pre-hospital implications and potential operationalizing of the device. Thank you guys for sticking around. Uh, my name is Justin Clay. Uh, I'm finishing up my training at Denver Health, uh, and then I'll be working at St. Anthony's uh, in Colorado starting this summer as well. Um, with Flight for Life Colorado. So, um, was anyone here last year for the Reboa Talks? A couple people. So, last year I really focused on kind of transport related issues to Reboa in anticipation that um, at some point in the very near future uh, we are going to be transporting patients from a level two or level three trauma center back to a regional uh, transport center or a regional trauma center. Um, but Reboa is changing so quickly, and um, this, this field, this kind of technique and the technology is moving with kind of lightning speed. So this year I wanted to just kind of give everyone an update on what's kind of new uh, in Reboa over the last 12 months. All right, uh, I will be talking about a couple of products, but I have no uh, disclosures. Uh, so here's what we'll talk about. So we'll we'll briefly talk about kind of what Reboa is and get everyone on the same page. We'll talk about new products that are out there. We'll talk about new literature, uh, new published algorithms, um, as well as some uh, new complications, and then kind of what's out there in terms of collaboration between kind of surgery and the emergency medicine world. Okay, so you guys probably know about Reboa, that's why you're here. Some of you guys have probably seen it uh, in use. Uh, some of you guys have been at conferences where they um, were kind of practicing with the Reboa. Can anyone give me just a, kind of a one line or a very quick definition of what Reboa is, kind of in the simplest terms? Yeah, so, uh, so there's kind of a theme this morning, and, and really, to be the way I think about it, in, in the simplest terms, it's a way to control hemorrhage. Um, so we use it for kind of all sorts of reasons, but kind of think about it as a mechanical way to control hemorrhage. So when do we use it? So we use it for patients that are exsanguinating below the diaphragm. So they're bleeding in their pelvis, they're bleeding in their belly, they've got a very proximal uh, lower extremity amputation. Um, they're essentially bleeding in the torso and it's non-compressible hemorrhage. So this isn't used for something we can put a finger on. In fact, we had a case the other day that we were kind of ready to put a Reboa in. It was a patient who had um, a couple of calf procedures and had a presumed pseudoaneurysm and was kind of posing from their femoral artery. Um, we got kind of set up to do a Reboa and then we realized we could just put a finger on it uh, and stop the hemorrhage and therefore the Reboa wasn't indicated. So it's someone who has non-compressible torso hemorrhage. Um, for the patient who's unstable, um, basically it has either no pulse or a uh, very low blood pressure. Um, and it's an alternative, it's a minimally invasive alternative to an ED thoracotomy. So the physiologic consequences of doing this, so 
you know, why do we do it? Well, we do it to stop hemorrhage. Um, we allow, we basically increase aortic root pressure, so we, otherwise we shrink the tank. Uh, we allow um, kind of improved perfusion of the brain uh, and the heart, and then um, it buys us time. I mean, this is a, a, a procedure that we do to get us to definitive repair. This is not a fix for whatever the underlying uh, pathology is. So just to get everyone kind of on the same page, um, to kind of know about Reboa, to talk about Reboa, to transport Reboa, you have to kind of know the terminology. Um, so in terms of this procedure, uh, the aorta is broken down into three zones. Uh, so zone one uh, is basically from the left subclavian down to the diaphragm. That's zone one. Zone three of the aorta is um, from the lowest renal artery or below the lowest renal artery to the bifurcation of the aorta. That's zone three. Everything in between is zone two. That's a no-go zone. In theory, we should not be putting a reboa there. Um, we use zone one. We'll put it in there for patients that are bleeding in their abdomen. And we'll use zone three for patients that are bleeding uh, in their pelvis. So. We did a podcast, Taming the Shrew, uh, not too long ago, and uh, Dr. Stewart uh, challenged me to come up with uh, a kit. So if one of the teams here this afternoon gets a call from um, a level two trauma center and they say, hey, we have this bad pelvic injury, we put in a Reboa, it's 5.01 in the afternoon, IR has gone home, uh, our surgical team has no interest in hacking this pelvis. We want to transport this patient now. Um, what, what do we need to know, what do we need to have kind of in our critical care transport vehicles to kind of do this? Um, and so this was my response to Stuart Wald's challenge. So, you need a way to secure the Reboa. Um, the new device, the old device, they don't have any way to kind of secure it once it's in. It generally gets put in, someone holds it, and the patient goes to the OR, uh, or they go to IR. But in the transport uh, environment, that's not realistic. Um, so we have to come up with a way to actually secure this device. So whether it's with one of the A-line uh, securing devices, a central line securing device, putting a purse uh, string stitch in it, before we transport a patient who has a Reboa, we've got to secure this device. Um, the sheath can be easily secured with, um, oops, with, you can see there's stitching in the sheath. This is a pointer. Um, you can see the blue sheath that's going into the uh, artery. That's sutured in. The yellow uh, catheter that's sticking out of the sheath is not sutured in. And that can move, and so we need to be able to secure that before we transport the patient, and so that's something that we should carry in our Reboa kit. Uh, I would also bring in my kit uh, a marking pen and some tape. So we need to be able to mark where this device is, where the surgeons or the emergency physician placed uh, the device so we know that it hasn't migrated. Uh, so we need some sort of marking pen or tape uh, on the device so we know where it is. The new devices um, that are out there have um, kind of hash marks um, on them so we kind of can write the number down on our kind of paper, but the old ones don't have any sort of marks so we need to be able to mark that. Um, we also need to be able to kind of manage this mess. So um, the old device, uh, and by old I mean Three weeks ago, it was the standard of care, and now there's a new one out there. Um, but this kind of device that most hospitals have that are doing Reboa is this Coda balloon catheter. And it comes with this wire that's about eight feet long, and it sticks out of the catheter. And so that all needs to be managed. That needs to be kind of coiled up, taped down before we transport a patient with this because we don't want that getting caught on the pram. We don't want to get caught in the rotor wash and kind of yanked out. Um, so we need to be able to kind of secure this device and tape it down. Uh, I'd also in my kit have some of our, our protocols. I'd have a documentation like this um, that you can model you know, on your, on your um, maybe a balloon pump uh, type of form um, that you can then do vascular checks throughout your transport. So I'd have something like this um, and then maybe a checklist. And if we ever get to the point where we're placing these pre-hospital, this would be a perfect kind of procedure for a checklist because it's a high risk procedure that we would not do that often. Um, and it's actually fairly technically pretty straightforward to do. And so I think a checklist for the actual procedure would, uh, would go well with this. 
Um, so again, you want to make sure when you're transporting this patient um, that you are doing, just like you do with your balloon pumps, you want to make sure that you're constantly um, doing vascular checks and documenting those. You want to make sure you do these kind of checks before you transport the patient and once you arrive at your uh, receiving facility. Um, and finally, it's other items that I would put in the bag. Um, so the new devices that we'll talk about in a minute um, can uh, transduce uh, an arterial pressure. So I'd have an A-line set up uh, in my bag. Um, I have extra tegaderms because this is it's kind of bloody and those things just don't stick very well, so I bring extra tegaderms. I have pre-filled syringes. If I'm transporting Rubo, I'd want to probably just a 10 cc syringe uh, so I can um, add some extra saline if I absolutely have to. If we're getting to the point where we're potentially placing this pre-hospital, I'd have a pre-filled 30 cc syringe uh, so I don't have to kind of pull up any uh, fluid when I'm uh, placing this, and then along those lines, I'd have an ultrasound in the rig as well. And then also um, the extra uh, stop cocks. Um, there's not many pieces to these devices. Um, this is one thing that can kind of come off, get lost, so I'd have extra stop cocks. <coughs> so that's what I would have in my uh, Reboa kit. Mike, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. All right. Um, so new devices. So this device. Um, <coughs> ER Reboa catheter just came out. Uh, it got approved uh, at the very end of last year and just hit the market um, earlier this year. Our shop got it, I think, about seven days ago, ten days ago. Um, we got the new catheters in. Um, it's a, the company is Prytime. They changed it from Prior Medical to Prytime. And this is a, the, kind of the only other FDA approved device. Um, and I think this is game changing. And I think most shops will ultimately go to this because it's a much simpler device to put in. It's much smaller, so traditionally the Coda Balloon catheters have a 12 or 14 French sheath, which is huge, um, it's kind of the size of your little finger that has to go into the artery, and 100% of the time those have to be repaired uh, in the OR, so that buys you know, the sick, broken patient another trip to the OR uh, when the catheter comes out. Um, this is a seven French, so it's essentially the same size as a central line, and it can, when it comes out, you just hold direct pressure on it, and, and you're done. Um, it also can, uh, it has an A-line um, at the end that's uh, uh, proximal to the balloon, so you can get um, A-line pressures even when the balloon is up, um, and there's no long wire. So this is a, um, a device that I think will kind of change um, the Reboa world. So, new literature. So, there's been lots and lots of literature that comes out kind of monthly. There's a new article on um, Reboa. Um, but a series came out of Japan this last year that kind of changed the way that we have been thinking about Reboa. Because up until this point, um, there's been lots of articles that have come out, mostly animal research, but now um, there's starting to be more kind of human case series, and they've all been very positive, and there's been no complications, and so on and so forth. Uh, this series came out. Um, and there were some kind of bad outcomes, and so this really kind of got the conversation going, um, that, like, hey, maybe this isn't the greatest device in the world. Uh, so this first paper came out. Um, it was a small study, single institution, um, no comparison group. Uh, they had 35 patients. Um, the mortality rate um, for their uh, 35 patients was almost 50%. They, they actually didn't have any complications um, from the Reboa, but um, about half the patients actually died that got the Reboa. Um, to be fair, most of those patients had pretty severe traumatic brain injuries. Um, their abbreviated injury scores were greater than three, so they, they had pretty severe brain injuries. Um, and then I think when we kind of talk about kind of what, what Japan is doing in terms of Reboa, I think it's fair to kind of talk about their trauma system because it is different than our trauma system. So in general, um, in Japan, it's an older patient population that's involved with trauma, and it's essentially, um, you know, the average age for their trauma patients are, it's about 60. Um, it's exclusively blunt trauma. They see no penetrating trauma in Japan. Um, they don't have in-house surgery kind of 24-7, um, like we do at our big institution, so there's kind of delay uh, to definitive care, and emergency physicians are the ones placing Reboa uh, in Japan. So as part of their residency, training, they have to do a certain number of uh, uh, balloon occlusion procedures, uh, just like we have to you know, put in central lines or do uh, intubations during our training. 
Uh, this particular study um, was a retrospective um, study over a five-year period. Uh, they um, looked at 52 patients, um, and they actually excluded about half of them because they do this thing called a secondary rubella. So once someone has a balloon occlusion, a, a, an open aortic cross clamp, in the OR they will take that cross clamp down after they've put in a, a balloon catheter to occlude the aorta. So those patients were excluded from this study. Um, so they had about 24 patients. Uh, 14 of them survived, 10 did not. Um, you can just see some table one uh, information here. So average age is about 60. Um, high injury severity scores, about half had chemoperitoneum, half had uh, pelvic ring fractures. Um, interestingly, the time from like, ED arrival to balloon inflation, the door to balloon time, is about 20 minutes. That's not something that we generally capture in our studies here. Uh, so that was interesting. But what caught everyone's attention with this study um, was the number of complications that they saw. So um, essentially, they had in this study of 24 patients, and they only looked at the survivors in terms of the complications. And so with the 14 survivors, nine of them had renal failure, nine of them had multi-organ failure. Uh, two of them had um, uh, limb ischemia from the balloon uh, being up. Um, one had an arterial injury from kind of blind insertion of the device. All three of those patients uh, lost their limb. Um, so they had some pretty severe uh, complications, um, and this caught, caught all of our eyes. Because here, our series that are coming out are all kind of saying, eh, we don't, we don't have a lot of complications. We haven't seen a lot of complications yet. Next, um, so this, the Nori study um, is actually a prospective study um, that is ongoing in Japan. It's similar to our aorta study that I'll talk about in a second, um, but it's a prospective observational trial, and it's um, all the big trauma centers in Japan are involved. They have many thousands of patients. Um, what they did uh, in this particular study was they used some fancy statistics uh, called propensity score matching, um, and we know that um, Patients that get uh, ED thoracotomies that get Reboa place their sicker patients, and so it's it's not fair to kind of compare those very sick patients and look at their mortality rates to patients that are likely less sick and therefore aren't getting thoracotomies and getting Reboas. So they did this propensity score matching. Um, and once they did that, and, and very briefly what that is, is they will take um, patients that are likely to get a similar treatment based on kind of how severely injured or how severely sick they are, and then compare those to the patients that actually got the treatment, and then they can actually look at kind of survival numbers. So in this study, with uh, 450 patients, that's 1% of their trauma patients actually had a Reboa place. Um, they found that the odds ratio for survival for someone getting a Reboa was 0 0.3. That means patients were three times more likely to die once they've been matched um, if they had a Reboa placed. So again, not such a great study for the proponents of Reboa here. Um, and then uh, let me skip this study because um, this is in the slide set. Um, you guys all have that. This was a fairly straightforward study that came out of shock trauma and University of Texas this year. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about this study that came out this week or last week. Um, so this is the aorta study. This is our this is the prospective observational trial that is ongoing in the United States. Um, they published some of their preliminary uh, results uh, last week uh, in abstract form, um, and some interesting data. So what this study is, right to the top, but basically this study is looking at thoracotomy um, versus Reboa. So they're capturing all of the uh, aortic occlusion, um, whether it's Reboa or thoracotomy, and they're going to kind of compare the groups. Um, the study's supposed to be going on through at least 2017, although I suspect it will continue, but this was just some of the initial numbers that came out. So they, um, they captured about 114 patients, and you can see at the top 40, or maybe you can't, but 46, uh, 46 of those had a Reboa place, the rest had ED thoracotomies, and then you can kind of see um, some of like how they access it. So cut down is about 50%. About a uh, third was just blind, placing the arterial line, and about 10% was actually using ultrasound. Um, they anticipate that as we move forward, there'll be more and more ultrasound-guided arterial access and less and less cut downs. But um, for now, about half are done with a cut down. 75% um, or 75-ish percent were zone one, so for uh, hemoperitoneum. 
uh, and about 19% were zone 3, and about 2% were oops, uh, zone 2, or it shouldn't be. Um, they didn't see a lot of complications. They had one patient with a pseudoaneurysm, two patients with an uh, embolism, no limb ischemia um, so far in the study. Um, and then interestingly for the, uh, the people that are comparing Reboa to ED thoracotomy, they actually did not find any difference in time to successful placement of the Reboa uh, versus time to open cross clamping. Uh, so that's important and um, the survival actually was about 28% in the Reboa patients and 16 in the open cross clamping and so no statistical difference between the two. So stay tuned. I'm sure they will continue to publish their results. Uh, so new collaborations. So this year we've seen a lot um, more kind of surgery and emergency medicine and critical care kind of collaborating on projects with Reboa. Um, so at my institution we are uh, working with our residents to get them trained, our emergency medicine residents, uh, doing Reboa. So we have a three-part training, we have a lecture series, and then we'll have hands-on kind of cadaver training, and then we'll um, Help the residents will help at their there's a Rocky Mountain trauma conference uh, annually. Um, they're uh, going to try to do kind of a pre conference. They don't want to call it Reboa because they don't want to anger their surgical colleagues. Uh, they're going to call it endovascular skills and trauma, um, but uh, they will have the emergency medicine residents kind of helping uh, during that conference uh, train the attendees. Uh, some of you guys were at Reanimate this year, so it uh, was mostly an uh, ED ECMO conference, but with a day doing uh, Reboa. So I know some of you guys in this room got to kind of play with the new uh, ER device, our uh, ER Reboa device, and I know there's a, another one coming up uh, this fall, and they'll probably do multiple um, Reanimates each year. Uh, so that's another opportunity for um, all of us to get some hands-on practice. Uh, and then Denver Health, where I work, is actually now going to start um, to, uh, they're going to put on a Reboa course. Uh, at the moment, right now, it's only open to surgeons, uh, but it sounds like probably over the summer, very soon, they're going to open up to emergency uh, medicine uh, positions, and it's going to be a monthly conference. So they anticipate they will be training lots of people um, to replace Reboa. And so I think after that, at least in, in kind of my region, this is where we kind of anticipate that we're going to start seeing this more kind of out in the community at the level three and the level two trauma centers. And that's when kind of the critical care transport community will kind of, I think, play a critical role uh, because these will absolutely be transported back to the regional trauma center. Um, and it's just a matter of time when we do the first one. Okay, uh, a couple new published algorithms on um, when to place Reboa, how do we place Reboa. Um, a couple came out this year. Um, so first, uh, this is our published algorithm. Um, so someone comes in, they've got torso trauma. Um, our first goal, assuming they have a pulse, if they don't have a pulse, they all get uh, ED thoracotomies, uh, assuming they've had uh, less than 10 minutes of CPR uh, for uh, blunt trauma and 15 minutes for penetrating trauma. Um, we are not doing Reboa for uh, patients that are in for cardiac arrest. Other institutions do. Um, so all those guys are getting uh, CPR and um, ED thoracotomy. Uh, but if they have a pulse, we're going to try to localize where the hemorrhage is, so we're going to do a fast exam, we're going to do um, what we call a big two, which is a uh, chest x-ray and a pelvic uh, x-ray. If someone has a positive fast, um, well, we'll go through the algorithm here. So uh, if someone has thoracic hemorrhage, that is a relative contraindication to putting in this Revo. Again, it's for people that are hemorrhaging below the diaphragm, and so if they've got a wide mediastinum or we, we suspect there's some sort of aortic uh, injury, we're not going to be placing Reboa. Um, if they have a positive fast, um, then it depends on their blood pressure. So if the patient is very hypotensive and they're not responsive to massive transfusion, um, then they're going to get a thoracotomy uh, versus a Reboa, uh, but at our institution, most of those guys are getting thoracotomies. Um, if they have a blood pressure between 60 and 80, then again, we'll consider Reboa, uh, but more likely they'll go to the OR for an XLAP. 
Um, and it, certainly if they're stable, if they have a temperature greater than 80, then they're just going to go to the OR, or CAT scan, or IR, or somewhere else. Um, if it's pelvic hemorrhage, so on our, on our x-ray, we've identified that they've got um, a broken pelvis, you know, and the quick digital radiography, we can kind of see it uh, almost real time. So they're unstable, they have a negative fast, they have a broken pelvis. Um, they are more likely to get a reboa than anything else, and that's generally where we're kind of going is mostly zone three reboas. Um, and so if they had blood pressure that's less than 60, um, they'll certainly get massive transfusion, but then um, they will, uh, will at least set up for the reboa. Um, and then if they are stable, then they're going to go to IR, go get pelvic packing. So this is our kind of algorithm uh, that was published this year. And then shock trauma has their algorithm. Um, it's a little bit different than ours. So shock trauma, there's actually been an interesting debate in the um, surgical journals this year, the acute care surgery journal, uh, between kind of the surgeons of shock trauma and the surgeons of Denver General. And there's been kind of back and forth um, each publication uh, in the kind of utility or futility of closed chest CPR. Um, so at shock trauma, their algorithm is the patient is hypotensive, they're non-responders to uh, blood, um, or, or they are in cardiac arrest then they are actually going to um, put the A-line in and kind of get set up for the Reboa. And then they'll kind of go through a similar algorithm. So they'll get a chest x-ray if they don't think there's an aortic injury. Uh, they get a FAST. Uh, if the FAST is positive, then they get a zone one Reboa. If the FAST is um, negative and they have a, a positive pelvic fracture, they get a zone three Reboa. If they are still hypotensive and they can't identify where the source is, they're gonna just get a zone one Reboa. Um, but the shock trauma folks will put in a Reboa um, with a patient who's getting CPR. Um, so they feel like they um, are fast enough um, at gaining access, um, and they believe that a few minutes of closed chest CPR um, is uh, worthwhile. Uh, our surgeons at our institution say no way. Um, if they don't have a pulse, we're not doing closed chest CPR. That's pointless. Um, so they get thoracotomy. So those are kind of the differences in some of these new published algorithms on when we place Reboa. Okay, and the last thing I want to talk about is just some of the complications that we've seen at our institution. And again, all this will be published uh, at some point. Um, but, you know, we, there's been a lot of talk about Reboa and how great it is and it's going to be the next thing. And no one's totally sure that's going to actually be the, the, the case. And, and five years from now, we may not even remember what Reboa is. Um, but um, we are starting to see some complications, and these are important to kind of talk about because these are they, they can be very significant complications. So um, we've done about I think eleven now uh, at our institution. Um, we've a couple of ones that I've seen. Does anyone kind of know what's going on in this picture? <coughs> yes, thank Yes, uh, we're left. Uh, what is that? The edge of two, two in the belly? Is yeah, actually, some of the I don't know. <laughs> so that might be. Um, but the bigger issue, at least immediately, is where that balloon is. So it's a zone two uh, balloon, um, and that's not where it should be, right? Because you can imagine kind of in the middle of the aorta is where all the takeoffs are for, for all the visceral organs, and you don't want to occlude those. Um, so this is one of our patients um, who got a zone two Ebola was recognized kind of after the patient was in the OR. So I think for us in the emergency department, um, and certainly prior to transport, we all needed to kind of look at these x-rays and make sure uh, it's in the right spot. And so this was a case where the patient had already gone up to the OR. They put the balloon in and said, all right, let's go, and went upstairs. And five minutes later, we look at the x-ray, and we kind of call them and we're like, hey, uh, not in the right place. Um, so we need to be able to, you know, at least from the emergency department, be able to kind of know where these things are supposed to be. Um, it's supposed to be a zone three Reboa. So uh, the bifurcation of the aorta is right around L4, so that's kind of a landmark you can use L L3, L4. Uh, this is clearly more kind of proximal to that. Um, so we've had a couple of zone two Reboas. Um, both were kind of recognized, um, but it's but they were not where they were supposed to be. Uh, we had we actually had one interesting uh, case where the sheath, um, and it's usually residents that are putting these uh, things in, and most people have seen it but haven't done it yet. So the resident that was putting this in um, 
hub that's the sheath, um, which normally, if you can remember from that first picture, that blue sheath that only kind of goes in the vessel uh, a couple inches. The sheath got hub. The balloon was supposed to be zone three. Um, they recognized that it was zone two, but they actually couldn't take down the balloon. It was stuck. Uh, and they, you certainly don't want to like yank on this balloon in the aorta, you don't want to tear the aorta. Uh, and no one was happy about the fact that they couldn't get this down. They were talking about an aortectomy, which I don't even know what that is, but it sounds very scary. Um, <laughs> so ultimately what they sorted out was because the sheath was hubbed, um, the balloon was caught uh, at the end of the sheath. And when they kind of retracted that um, sheet, they were able to pull down the balloon. Um, that wasn't until the patient was in the OR. So that was a good kind of learning kind of point for us. Um, and we just need to make sure we know how to place this thing. But so we've seen a few complications at our institution. Um, now there's some published data with the aorta trial, other uh, complications. So I anticipate there will be more. Um, this isn't a perfect device. Um, but um, people are very excited about it, and I anticipate we will just see more and more of it, and the transport community will start to see some uh, as well. So that's all I have. Um, I have no idea what time it is, but I'm happy to stay and take questions, because I'm assuming it's lunch time. All right, folks, that was an unbelievable lecture. We certainly hope you enjoy what would make us even more delighted is if you would consider coming to CCTMC in person and meeting the entire cast and characters in the following year, in 2017. Chris, tell them all about it. Absolutely. Um, if you guys would like to join us, we are in San Antonio in 2017. And if you would like to check us out on the website, we are at ampa.org. That's A-M-P-A dot org. Uh, we have also put this together in association with our partner or organizations, the Air and Surface Transport Nursing Association, as well as the International Association of Flight and Critical Care Paramedics. So if you guys are able uh, to come to meet us all, uh, we have a great group of people that all care very deeply about critical care transport and medicine, and I hope to see you in San Antonio in um, the spring of 2017. The best speakers, the best pre-hospital content, need we say any more? This is Faison Arshad and Chris Fulgar wishing everyone a safe tour.